Howdy folks, my name is Mike Eastman. I'm Gordon Eastman's oldest son, founder of the Eastman Hunting Journals. We're going on a trip with my father back starting in 1955, his legacy with wild sheep. He started filming with the California bighorns up in lower BC, which was British Columbia. A very rare sheep was hardly any of them left. And you're gonna see rare footage of all through his life filming bighorn sheep, filming dull sheep, filming stone sheep. We're going places that dad went back when people never even set foot in some of these creek drainages. Heck, one of them is even named after him. So come along with me and you're gonna see the legacy of my father and wild sheep of North America. Oh, what a band of rams. As I watched these sheep, it suddenly reminded me of a poem that Kipling wrote about the rooftop of Asia. And it fits this absolutely perfect. Do you know the world's white rooftop? Have you ever felt her wintry blast as the shadows drift and change? Do you know the long day's patience down on frozen grass while the heads of heads is laying within range? Well, I'll tell you, it's here we're going for the years of plans and dreams you shall never know. For we've sworn an oath on the horns of the Ovis Poli. And when mountain gods have called, we must go. We're gonna go to Alaska with Dad and Stan Harriman and Ted Wilcox and Ed Pittman as they do a DIY hunt in 1956 for Alaska dull sheep, moose, and caribou. We had talked about Alaska and uh, saw this Alaska license plate on a car outside the jewelry store. And he went out and started talking to him. We got lined up with Lee Holen up in Alaska. We corresponded with him and that's how we got up there to hunt. Was it quite an adventure going up there? I mean, back in 1957, it wasn't like they had a gas station <laughs> around every corner. No, of course, we drove night and day. Got to Anchorage and Lee was uh, in the Air Force. He had this uh, little Super Cub with big balloon tires on it. He could only haul one person at a time, so we flipped. He said, you got to go in first. He had scouted before, and I won the flip, and I got to go first. And so that's how we got in there. Uh, we had a little two-man tents. You could look out of the tent or sit around, and you could watch sheep all day long. There were lots and lots of sheep. And I think the highlight of that trip was your dad and I were out one day and I think we both had our sheep at that time but we were still out looking and we spotted down in a ravine there were two of them laying down two big old rams and they got up and ram each other and you could hear it all up and down the valley. Then dad the next year in 1957 he went back up there with a camera, documented hunts, and guided for Lee Holen. We come up over the mountain, come around it, saw the flat plateau there that had sheep on it. We come in pretty hot, and, and he didn't have a bit of problem. Those big donny tires really helped. Then he'd bring one guy at a time and all their gear. What he could take off with, he could land with. But going out of here would be a different problem at that altitude. And we used nothing but a little mountain climber's uh, backpack gear. And at that time, it was just starting to come into its own. We'd have to stay there seven days, we thought. But we got bad weather and ended up staying here 10 days. Ate nothing but sheep meat and dehydrated food. And there were sheep everywhere. Most of the sheep that I saw in that early days were all record book class sheep. A lot of them up. You know, we're over 40 inches, and these two guys weren't the greatest shots in the world. I know that old Jake uh, shot a three before he killed one. This is it. We didn't worry about it, and I don't ever remember measuring one for the record book at that time. He just didn't uh, really care that much, but this is the 
5th or 6th of August, we I remember it, it started snowing, and that was a problem. George killed this uh, real fine ram. You notice they both have real wide flared curls. That was kind of a hereditary factor in that area. They eventually did kill the world's record right here. My dad's next adventure was when the Canadian government called him up and said, hey, Gordon, how would you like to go in the Northwest Territory to the McKinsey Mountain Range and let us know what kind of animals are in there to hunt? It had never been hunted before, and the government wanted to make sure it was feasible to take hunters in there. We stood here looking at one of the most isolated spots in the world. It was the Plains Abraham in the McKinsey Mountains, Northwest Territories of Canada. I want to get a picture of you walking here, he said. And I said, you picture me? We well, said, yeah, I want to get a picture of you walking. So I was just strutting, I was high-stepping. And I said, no, how do you want me to walk? Do you want me to, well, I'll just look off in the distance, he said, like you're, and I, well, I'm really walking. See, and all he's doing is taking a picture of my sore feet. <laughs> That's the start of the movie. <laughs> what an introduction. I got a, an idiot with me that feet hurt. For a thousand miles, many of lace, and his feet hurt. So dad took three of his friends and went in there on a DIY and took his camera and documented them hunting sheep in there. See, it hadn't been hunted and never been filmed. It's a big mountain range. Oh, five, six hundred miles long, about that wide, huge. They told us that we did good hunt. Whatever we wanted, whatever we needed, um, no guides, we were just on our own. They wanted us to show the people what the Northwest Territories held in the way of game. It was unbelievable. This is one of those big gorges. We were coming up one of those, we'd spotted some sheep. And here was a lone ram, and he spotted us, and he came to this boulder and jumped up on it. He'd never seen a man in his life. To our knowledge, uh, there hadn't been anybody in the country before. Even the Indians were so isolated, they didn't go there. He comes to that big boulder, and he's kind of smelling us with his nose and tasting the air with his tongue. We were in the southern end of the Plains of Abraham, going along the plain, and we saw a sight. Anybody that loves the outdoors, they give a lot to see. It was 18 mature doll rams. There was hardly a sheep in there. There wasn't a full curl. They bunched together. They were afraid. And they were curious. They didn't know what we were. I expected them to scatter and run. But they didn't. They did a curious thing. He just lined up shoulder to shoulder. And all at once, here they came to us. They wanted to see what we were. They walked another 50 yards closer and all laid down, and half the sheep went to sleep. There's rams in there with a curl and a quarter. We'll go six feet at a time. This took us several hours. I had that heavy camera. It was hard on your elbows and your knees. We looked the sheep over real carefully. Boy, what a band of rams. My, they all jumped up. They missed the whole band. How do you miss 18 sheep? You're dead was you two sons of bitches. He said, I mortgaged my house to get us guys up here. Everything I've got's in this. And you two guys make fools of yourself out there. And I said, boy, he was mad. The hair was up on his neck. And I said, Gordon, the public wants to see those sheep get away. They want to see two guys like me and Ed make fools of ourselves and them all get away. I said, they will be really happy. So, and it was that way. That, I was actually watching the movie myself. I was glad that those two fools didn't get any of them. <laughs> <laughs> we were missing them at 100 feet. Oh, we're shooting them up. Yeah, I had a hair trigger in that gun of mine. 
Paris so shot, I don't think he aimed, and it scared me, and I pulled the trigger on mine. I don't even know where the first shot went. <laughs> <laughs> There's several full curl rams here. My, what a sight. And they shot a couple of times, and they did hit a couple of them. They killed two full curl rams. I walked back over where I heard the shooting, and they had two beautiful full curl rams. Now, these sheep aren't quite as large as the sheep in Alaska. Probably a gene factor but they're Arctic sheep. That evening, I got a chance to hunt for this ram. I saw him alone, took the gun, and actually ran him down. I was in awful good shape. I wouldn't tell you that if it wasn't true. Where we shot that rainbow where we were walking through the right. base of that rainbow? Yeah. Oh, man, that, is... that was 11 o'clock at night. I walked out there. I just walked outside there, and I walked over there, and I seen that rainbow. I couldn't believe it. They had them real rainbows up there in the north, you know. And then, God, it was unbelievable. And I run back in and said, "Come on, you guys, quick! We're gonna walk through a we're gonna walk through a rainbow." And they said, Are "You nuts!" I said, "No." I begged. I said, "You got to come out here." And I finally said, "Well, okay." And they came out there, and that George had seen it, and then they grabbed the cameras. And we walked right through that rainbow. I'd never seen another shot like that in anybody's movie. No, Mother Nature didn't care we came in this beautiful land, or we'd never got to film the most beautiful rainbow I've ever seen. No, she hadn't cared. We not only got to film it, we got to do a thing I've never seen anybody do before. We got to stand at the end. In the mid 60s, Dad went to uh, British Columbia into the Cassiars. He really loved that place. In fact, him and my mother homesteaded on a lake and built a cabin. And for three or four summers up there, they spent filming and documenting stone sheep. I spent a lifetime in the outdoors, filming in the outdoors. And this great province has the most abundant wildlife, hunting and fishing I've ever seen. They call this great province a sleeping giant with its untapped resources and beautiful wild country. So come along with me this spring. Let's spend a summer high, wild, and free, and see this great sleeping giant before it awakes. We saw lots of stone sheep, but just seeing a sheep wasn't good enough for us. We had to find a fine ram, and also we had to be able to get there with a the camera. We spotted a band of rams early one morning. The sun was just coming up, and they're laying way above us, atop this mountain. Quite often, if they got the height on you, they're not afraid of you. <laughs> All the times rams will lay on the top of a mountain this way and watch you by the hour. They have an eight power eye. They can see a man three miles away. And that's one of the good reasons they're so tough to hunt. My brother took a really big sheep that's uh, Boone and Crockett in Gordon took a huge Boone and Crockett stone sheep. He filmed, at that time, the largest stone sheep ever filmed. 
We spent the better part of the morning working our way up to where we saw him. But on a shale slide, just below us, about 500 yards, was a big ram with a full curl. We not only needed that ram for the trophy, we needed the meat. They were spread out all over this mountainside. There were eight in the band all together. He had a big full curl. It's Brad shot. He had trouble working that gun. But he got him. There was another ram that turned and ran when he heard the shot, and he came right below the camera. There's a difference between hunting and killing. This was a fine trophy sheep. He was 42 inches around the curl at a 14 inch base. He was a beautiful stone sheep. I stayed behind and hunted for stone ram and film for another couple of months. Leo Miller came in and one day, I saw a great ram. He was the most perfect stone sheep I've ever seen. He had a 45-inch curl. He was 15 inches around the base. He was absolutely perfection. A great stone ram like this fellow here, the trophy of a lifetime. I'll never kill another stone sheep. One's enough for any man. That was the last time my father hunted sheep. He hung his gun up. He said, no man should take more than a big ram like this, but once in a lifetime. And from that time on, my dad did nothing but film and document North American sheep with his camera. Quite often when you're hunting, it's tough to film. Animals have six senses about being hunted. I've never got any good wildlife footage when I've had my gun along. As Leo Miller and I started down the hill with the stone ram, we spotted a band of stone sheep. There were 12 in the band, all rams. They stood there and watched us. I got within 40 yards. When sheep are a little nervous, they'll stamp a back foot. The two rams on the right here are the largest stone sheep I've ever seen. They'll probably be the largest two rams ever filled. I eased right up on them. They didn't seem to be too afraid. That one on the right, he's got a curl and a quarter, tremendously heavy. What a beautiful trophy. Watch the one on the left here. He rang his tail a little. Oh, I believe in hunting. You know, I'd rather film those three sheep than ever kill one. The last chapter of Dad's North American Sheep Adventures is the Phantom Ram. Dad told me that this was probably his best film he ever done, and I think he was right. One of the reasons is he took a particular ram and documented two or maybe three years of him during the rut. And that was probably the best film Dad ever did on North American sheep. I've just completed a film that took me two and a half years to shoot. And since there was 30,000 feet, five miles of footage, it took me a whole year to edit it. The name of the film is The Phantom Ram. This guy right here. You know, he's unique in many ways. He's the main central character in the film, and it's the first time that you're going to see a wildlife film, to my knowledge, where you can identify with the main actor. Because you can 
identify this ram from his horn structure and the way he looks. What a thrill to see a monarch in the mountains like this guy. He's right at the end of his life, full grown, 350 pounds, and he has that regal look about him. He holds his head up and looks like he owns the world, and the other younger rams come over to admire him and nuzzle him a little. He's all business. He's gonna check these ewes out. Even though he knows that none of them will come in heat for a month, he's gonna walk through them and make sure there isn't a ewe ready to breed. What a thrill to film something like this big guy. You know, I was to find out that there's real affection among these bighorn sheep. Take all the animals in the world, and you won't see that only among a male and female. But these guys, these bighorn rams, they really like each other. They admire a bigger ram, an older ram. One like this guy with a full curl. He comes up and nuzzles him and looks him all over rubs his horn and his big horns. He says, boy, someday I'd like to be like you. And the old ram just stands there, transfixed, lets him perform his little ritual. I saw this time after time. There's an admiration for these full curl big horn rams by the other sheep. That's very evident. There's sheep running every direction. It's right at the height of the breeding season. The old phantom ram come along, a young ram started pushing him around. He said, hey, get on my way, kid. And he calmly shoved him right around that rock in that hole. He moved along 30 yards further and suddenly here appeared the two rams that put the hurt on him last fall. You know, this is the identical spot the same day, the day before Thanksgiving. It happened right here. A year ago. Same two sheep. Now they followed him along, pushed him around a little. He ran over about a hundred yards. The only difference between this and last year, there's snow on the ground. He suddenly runs down the mountain about a hundred yards. He did that last year. Both the sheep charged him at one time. He don't know which one to take. Now he'll turn around quickly and faint the one on the right that's going to hit him in the side. And what happened last year, he didn't get back quick enough. And the one in front of him plowed right into him with his horns. Faints the one on the right, gets back in time, but this terrible impact pushed him around and that ram hit him in the side on the other side from where he'd been hit the year before. But you know, he'd met that ram square in the front and it hadn't hurt him. To think they'd do it in the same place the same day a year later was unreal to me. He just kept moving along like nothing had happened. While my father for 50 years was wandering around North America filming wildlife and hunting, my poor mother was left home with the bills and three wild western teenage boys to take care of. One night she sat down at the kitchen table and wrote the lyrics to this song. I hope you enjoy it. Far beyond the sound of the city's roar Where the land is like it was before There still waits a wilderness My wandering man cannot resist 
He walks in wonder like a wide-eyed child all through the glory of the savage wild where he's free to live or die while the world and I go spinning by. The work of early pioneers like my father Gordon in the tireless effort of conservationists, including the Wild Sheep Foundation, has preserved and continues to protect the legacy of wild sheep in North America. Till he comes home to me again. He walks in wonder like a wide-eyed child all through the glory of the savage wilds where he's free to live or die while the world and I go spinning by he walks in wonder like a wide-eyed child all through the glory of the savage wilds where he's free Spinning by